Well, it is 12 o'clock and I joyfully greet everyone who's attending this. Uh, my name is Jeff Johnson. I serve on the English faculty here and I also direct this series. In Verse Like Water, the Visiting Poet Program of Central Lakes College <clears throat> concludes its ninth year of programming uh, today and National Poetry Month with a poetry reading by Valgina Mort. All poetry readings begin with thanks and praise. <clears throat> and I wanna thank our sponsors this time out, which as usual is the Minnesota Legacy Fund, Five Wings Arts Council, as well as uh, Minnesota Public Radio. Valgina, I'll say uh, to you what I said to Joy Harjo last November and Padre in early April. Virtual readings uh, nudge me to uh, skip my long-winded introductions and I've traded those out just for a very brief story to try to tie into what, what I think we're up here today, up to today. And I wanna tell you, Vagina, about five years ago, I was uh, shopping in a thrift store with my mother and my sister and we encountered a sport coat that my mom wanted me to have because it reminded me of uh, my dad. And I put it on and it was a little big on me. And um, she said, don't worry, my sister said, don't worry, I've got a Russian seamstress. I'm like, what do you mean you have a Russian seamstress? And we went across the Mississippi River to a kind of a crap strip mall and found this delightful woman uh, in, in a first rate shop. And we exchanged uh, some pleasantries, visited a little bit. And when I saw the giant map of Belarus hanging on the wall, I said to her, would you do me a favor? She said, absolutely. I said, when you were a girl, you memorized Pushkin. Would you please recite one or two lines right now in Russian? And she smiled and tipped her head back and she recited an entire poem uh, uh, in Russian by, by Pushkin. And then she jumped up and ran around the counter and hugged me, proclaiming that I had turned her for a moment uh, into a girl again. My sister thought it was uh, that I had been struck by this moment of clairvoyance, but that's not true. I'm just a poetry fan. And I know that there are countries in the world where poetry is taken more seriously, where the poetic feeling uh, is valued more than it is in other places. And I know Belarus is such a country and you are, you are proof of that. <clears throat> Thank you so much for making these poems and these books for us. Thank you so much for reading today. And I cannot be more excited because, uh, and I have to thank you too, for giving this troubled world exactly what it needed earlier this spring, which was an entire poetics founded on the patterns that you observe in Belarusian hand towels. And with that, uh, let's just give a smattering of Zoom applause, which is always quiet, but we're gonna do it anyway. Uh, take it away, Belgina. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you so much, Jeffrey, for uh, inviting me. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in. I'm going to read some poems, and um, then I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you all. Uh, I'll start with a poem, Bus Stops Ars Poetica. Um, a poet from Barbados, Kamau Brathwaite, uh, when talking about his relationship uh, as a Caribbean poet with tradition, said that hurricane does not roar in iambic pentameter. And um, uh, for me, uh, somebody who comes out of a Belarusian tradition, uh, in which Pushkin was often imposed on us, right? That's um, a colonial culture. Um, that we had to memorize and look up to um, at the expense of our own. Um, I say too often to myself that uh, um, for me, um, my city uh, or my country does not run in iambic pentameter. Uh, the um, Chernobyl reactor does not explode in iambic pentameter. And uh, the public buses, which I grew up taking around uh, my home city of Minsk, do not run in iambic pentameter. Uh, the streets and the bus stops in Minsk are named often after very dubious historical characters. I think that that's something that um, you here in the United States can understand too, because uh, you're going through a very important project of revisiting a lot of your own history and um, uh, dealing with a lot of um, your own uh, namings of buildings, squares, and monuments. 
And so I grew up in a city full of monuments to murderers, uh, full of um, streets named after people who never recognized um, uh, my people as people. And so this Ars Poetica takes you on such a route around Minsk. Not books, but a street, open my mouth like a doctor's spatula. One by one, streets introduce themselves with the names of national murderers. In the state archives, covers hardened like scabs over the ledgers. Inside a tiny apartment, I built myself into a separate room, peopled it with the calibans of plans for the future. Future that runs on the schedule of public buses, from the zoo to the circus, what future? What is your alibi for these ledges, these streets, this apartment future? In the purse that held through seven wars, the birth certificates of the dead, my grandmother hid from me chocolates. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. The purse opened like a screaming mouth. Its two shiny buckles watched me through doors, through walls, through jazz. Who has taught you to be a frightening face, purse? I kiss your buckles. I swear myself your subject. August. Apples, I have no body. August, for me, a ripe apple is a brother. For me, a four-legged table is a pet. In the temple of supermarket, I stand like a candle. In the line to the priestesses who preserve the knowledge of sausage prices, the virginity of meal cartons, my future, small change future that runs on the schedule of public buses. Streets introduce themselves with the names of national murderers. I build myself into a separate room where memory, the illegal migrant in time, cleans up after imagination. In a room where memory strips the beds, linens that hardened like scabs on the mattresses, I kiss little apples, my brothers. I kiss the buckles that waters through walls, through years, through jazz, chocolates from a purse that held through seven wars, the birth certificates of the dead. Hold me, brother apple. Um, at the center of that poem that I just read is this screaming purse. And uh, inanimate objects are very important to me in, and to, this po to the poems in this particular book that I'm reading from, because I come from a, a country of what can be called an empty family archive, uh, a country uh, of long censorship burnt documents, closed archives, and um, uh, the kind of ideology, ideology of triumph and victory that um, is the only story that is allowed, even in private. Um, in my family, for example, when um, we would talk about the past or ancestors, uh, it would be always in harsh tones and always with a disclaimer of uh, the fact that it could not be repeated anywhere else, which was true for so many families everywhere. Because uh, Belarus uh, has been, well, it could be, if you want to study this history of 20th century in Europe, the worst of it, it's enough to study Belarus in the 20th century. World War I went through us and brought a lot of dislocation. Um, the Stalin's repressions in the 30s affected millions of families and, you know, a lot of executions without any trials took place in the 30s. That's already my grandmother's lifetime. 
Um, then World War II, we were occupied for three years. Every third person died in Belarus during World War II. There were the genocides of the peasants and the Holocaust of Belarusian Jews. Um, so the country was completely devastated. And of course, afterwards, the, um, the Soviet experiment was also not particularly a human friendly experiment, uh, which combinated, which kind of came to its climax with the Chernobyl explosion in the 80s when I was four. And so um, there is very little witnessing. There's very little um, left of alternative history and it all has to be gathered by crumbs. Um, and um, I always feel uh, that objects, um, trees, purses, doors, tables, whatever is left, whatever survived, because humans could not survive, is imbued with stories, with testimony. And it is the job of an artist, the job of a poet to listen to the testimony of these languageless beings. And um, this next poem that I'm going to read in attempt at a genealogy speaks exactly to that. And at the center of it are these missing letters, Václav's letters. Václav is not Václav Havel, as one could think, when, because when Václav and letters come together, a lot of people think that it's uh, Václav Havel. A uh, great Czech playwright and uh, president of uh, the Czech Republic at, uh, at a certain point. Um, so those are not his letters out of prison. They're the letters of my grandmother's brother, which she confessed, I've never met him, um, uh, but uh, she confessed that they exchanged letters at one point, they were separated. And he wrote to my grandmother and then she lost them. And so that sense of uh, loss of these letters and what they could have told, not even in the stories and in the, in the narratives that were contained in them, but just in the fact of their handwriting, just in the paper that was touched by um, somebody who um, is not available to me, who is completely erased from history. And uh, I wrote this poem in Rome, in Italy. So it begins in Roman basilicas. Where am I from? In black basilicas, dragged incessantly down a cross, is a man who here resembles a dress snatched from a hanger. There, thick clouds of muscles and overcast body, embodied weather of one hardly known country, a country where I'm from, dragging him. They stick their hands under his armpits. How cozy their hands are in such a warm place. Through a cut in his chest, Eve watches with her one bloody eye. A cut in the chest, a red eyelash. But where am I from? Yes, a man resembles a dress snatched from a hanger. Inside black alphabet, dragged incessantly down, each letter is a man. To a telephone in a long hallway as if to a well for water. Well, where am I from? Neither mamas nor papas. My round face takes after a rotary phone. A rotary phone is my gene pool. My body rings as it runs to put my head on the strong shoulder of the receiver. Blood is talking. Blood connection is weak. Inside the receiver, I hear a crackling as if fire were calling. Who is this? It's me, fire receiver. But where am I from? Days of merciless snow in the kitchen window. Snow got deposited like fat under our skin. How large we grew on those days. 
so much time spent at the kitchen table, trying to decide where to put commas in sentences about made up lives. Yet no one bothered to tell us that words uttered once crowd in the brain as in a hospital lobby. The time is supposed to heal only because once it was seen with a scalpel in its hands. You've made a mistake, you'd say mysteriously, pointing at lines written by a child. Think of another word with the same root, as if words can have roots, as if words didn't come from darkness, cat in the bag words, as if our human roots were already known to us. Here's grammar, here's orthography, here's a paper rag, bread, milk, butter. What roots? What morphology? What rules of subjugation? How is it even possible to make a mistake? Here's physics, chemistry, geometry with its atlas. Now, where are Václav's letters, 1946? What to do about the etymology of us, our etymology. 1946 crowds my hospital lobby. The face of a rotary phone, the face of a clock, the face of a radio on the wall. These are my round-faced progenitors. But Václav's face, where? Again, a man resembles a dress snatched from a hanger. And where are the letters? one per week in his best Sunday handwriting. Inside the receiver, fire. How cozy are my ears in such a warm place, but where am I from? A post-war Minsk barracks, the joy of a first apartment, a coat, a jacket, a leather purse, fat with pills, but where are the wear letters from the wear face? Evacuated face, de-evacuated face, sick not sick, stuck through face, vacuum face, lab rat face. This country was tested on Václav's face. Now we can live in peace. So where am I from? A post-war city, barracks, the joy of a deactivated face, vacated face, a face snatched from a hanger absence as an inner organ. In a village known for a large puddle where all children fall between the two categories of those who hurt the living things and those who hurt the non-living things. In a village known for being unknown, where am I from? A graveyard around an old church the frightening alphabet around the village, an alphabet on gravestones, marble letters under the moth-eaten snow. Under the moth-eaten snow, my motherland has good bones. My motherland rattles its bone keys. A bone is a key to my motherland. My motherland rattles its bone keys. Eve watches with her one red eyelash under the moth-eaten snow. My motherland has good bones. In my motherland, people kneel before wells. In my motherland, people pray to the crosses of flying birds. A bone is a key to my people. Among my people, only the dead have human faces. Still, where am I from? Women saints in berets of golden threads. Who are these at your feet, sitting like pets? An angel with wings of a peacock. An angel with a human face. But who are these at your feet, sitting like pets? Now, if you wear such golden berets, 
if you tame children and angels, if your white boneless fingers leave through a book while I gnaw on this wooden verse, would you, holy women who wear golden berets, braid the hairs on my tongue into a pigtail? a mouse tail of a word for a word loving rodent. Inside my alphabet, dragged incessantly down each frightening letter is a man. My frightening alphabet in his best Sunday handwriting. A letter addressed to lost letters, phone face, clock face, radio face. Face is an inner organ. Where are Václav's letters is an inner organ. On the borderlines of my motherland, wet laundry claps in the wind like gunfire. Have you heard about my motherland? My motherland is a raw yolk inside a Fabergé egg. This yolk is what gives gold its color. This face is a fire receiver. This face is an inner organ, a bone as a key to my people. Where am I from? The golden bones of my motherland are ringing. Put your bones into braids of graves, woods. Put your bones into braids of graves, ravines. Put your bones into braids of graves, fields. Put your bones into braids of graves, swamps. Put your graves into braids of bones, mother. Put your graves into braids of bones, moth. Put your graves into braids of bones, ghost. Put your graves into braids of bones, guest. Braid your bones neatly. Braid your bones bravely. Finger comb your bones into neat braids in our woods, ravines, fields, swamps. And we'll stay right here in this graveyard. This next poem is called To Antigone a Dispatch. Um, Antigone is a, a Sophocles heroine um, who insists on burying her brother, even though orders are given not to touch his corpse slain in battle, not to give him a proper burial. But she breaks the law. She says that there has to be a law above this human law. And according to that law, we should always give our human kin, a proper burial. And she goes to her sister, Esmene, and she says, my sister, can you go and help me bury a brother? And she says, no, 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 I'm a law obeying citizen. <laughs> I'm not going to break the law. Uh, and so Antigone has to go by herself and do that. Uh, but uh, for me, Antigone is not so much a some kind of academic reference to an ancient tragedy. She's uh, a fairy tale character uh, who uh, does the forbidden thing, right? You remember those wonderful fairy tales in which something is forbidden, do not open the door, open any door but that door, pick any flower but this flower, and we know that our protagonist is going to go and immediately break break this law. Um, and so I invite Antigone here as this wonderful lawbreaker. Um, I invite her to Belarus in the spirit of sisterhood because we have a lot of unburied bones. Um, quite literally, uh, we have a, a site of mass execution um, uh, from the 30s uh, called Kurapati uh, in the outskirts of Minsk, the capital of Belarus, my home city. And it's a, a mass burial that was uh, discovered uh, when I was a child, uh, but it was forbidden uh, to um, do anything about it. We do not know 
how many people are buried there, why they were executed, uh, when and how, um, and um, uh, the government constantly tries to build some kind of highways there, or even restaurants on the bones. Uh, so um, there is that kind of um, great um, struggle to um, stop, to honor the silence, but also to stop it, because often honoring honoring the silence is um, by um, so uh, well. Here we go, and to connect this to the current events in Belarus, to the great violence that erupted in August, uh, we learned in August that people were uh, captured and tortured uh, by police. Uh, quite literally tortured, beaten into comas in police custody. And it was all hidden, right? Still the government insists that it never happened despite the mutilated bodies in the hospitals. What they do is then go and arrest the doctors who speak out. Uh, and so people formed a human chain between the prison, the Christian prison in Minsk and the Khurapati forest. And they stood, um, stood as this kind of human chain all across the city, connecting the two great silences, the two suppressed wounds, Kurapati forest and the Akrestin prison. Antigone, dead siblings are set. As for the living, pick me for a, me for a sister. I too love a proper, Funeral, dragged against sisters, pop up, burial. Landlady, I make the rounds of graves, keeping up my family's top notch properties. On a torture instrument called an accordion, I stretch my bones into fingers of a witch. My guts have been emptied like bellows for the best sound. Once we settle your brother, I'll show you forests of the unburied dead. We'll clean the way only two sisters can clean a house. No bones scattered like dirty socks. No ashes at the bottom of kneecaps. Why bicker with husbands about dishes when we've got mountains of skulls to shine? Labor and retribution will share, not girly secrets. Brought up by dolls and monuments, I have the bearings of a horse and a bitch. I'm cement in tears. You can spot my graves from afar, marble like newborn skin. Here, history comes to an end, like a movie with rolling credits of headstones, with nameless credits of mass graves. Every ditch, every hill is suspect. Pick me for a sister, Antigone. In this suspicious land, I have a bright shovel of a face. I tell you scary stories, but you, I hope um, you sense that I really appreciate humor uh, in my work. And I always try to laugh um, through uh, violence, which is something that is very true of what is happening in Belarus these days. Um, and there is very little pathos and that kind of talk of heroism among people who are in prison, for instance. Uh, they write letters in which they tell jokes and they turn everything into these humorous stories because that's, that's the strength of spirit to laugh through it. So I want, always want to honor humor. Um, that is what carrying us through these events. Uh, this, this next poem I'm going to read is called Music Practice. Uh, Music runs through this whole book as um, something that uh, I look for, um, uh, looking for particular kind of music arranged out of plain words, 
Um, but also quite literally, I'm interested in how music and sense of uh, who I am uh, and my family lineage um, work together and trauma, uh, how music is often a synonym for trauma. Um, I grew up studying music um, in a very Soviet fashion, practicing four hours a day after my school as a child. Um, so I often felt that it was music was great imposition and uh, not something to enjoy, but something to kind of brave through in my day. And um, it was my grandmother who made me uh, study music and practice it. And at one point I learned that um, my grandmother barely knew her father who died very, very as a young man um, in the Polish Soviet war. Um, and um, the only thing she remembered about him is that he was a very musical man, that he sang beautifully to her, to, to his only daughter. She had five brothers. Uh, she, he sang very beautiful and played instruments. And so I learned that because of that vague memory uh, of a man that I never knew, music was imposed on me. And my whole childhood and adolescence what was shaped by my grandmother's trauma and loss. Uh, and so this is how this man I never met uh, was uh, influenced and in many ways burden and imposition on, on me. Music practice. In the intermission between two wars, your father sang a song. By the time I heard this song, it had no music. Patching the lyrics with mm and ah. After the third war, you got by as a seamstress. You lost the thread of melody and pitch. This, do this song, my daily dose of radiation or vaccination without words, except for off-key mooing, except for for Loki bleating, this song limping through the lump in the throat. My dad always peeping, tomming, always back pocketing my small girl brain. Should I go ahead and confess that in the name of that man who played any instrument thrown at him, a symbol of a mandolin, a fiddle, but ended up quickly killable once thrown into a war? not even a great one at that, I was drafted into music. Because of you, because your sole memory of your father was a man singing a tune in the gooseberry yard to a toddler who later could remember neither words nor melody. I had to learn Bach, Brahms, Rachmaninoff, Hayden, on a red accordion, I had to put in over 32,000 hours of music practice. Not unlike the Nazis, on, a on your dainty wristwatch, you meticulously kept track of my every sitting, subtracted trips to the bathroom, carried out under your disapproving, suspecting gaze. I had neither ear nor voice for it. Neither did you, I would add, since now you cannot contradict me. What can a toddler, mouth full of gooseberries, understand about a song? What could a tongue remember after loss and hunger? If I didn't know how we are made, I'd say you had no father at all. His song sounds too improbable. It goes mm, and ah, without melody, without music. All there is to it is your sad face that goes mm, and ah, to Bach, Brahms, Rachmaninoff. Mm. So there was a bit of radiation in this poem. Um, and uh, yesterday was the 35th anniversary of the uh, Chernobyl disaster. Belarus received 70% of the radiation fallout. 
it is very much a Belarusian tragedy. And uh, it is, uh, for me, it is another way um, in which I think of fairy tales, uh, the idea of monsters, monster animals, monster babies, um, uh, monstrous forms of being, the idea of that anything can turn out to be a poison. <laughs> yeah, anything is not what it seems. It became a reality early on. And so it kind of enters some of these poems. And I think often out of context, it can be read as a metaphor, but it is not a metaphor at all. Uh, so this, I'll read two more poems. Sounds good. Um, so this one is called Nocturne on a Mov Moving Train. Um, and then a short one. So there are some fairy tale themes here, like talking trees, uh, which is another way of witnessing too, that kind of a burden that trees have to watch what we cruel, stupid humans do to each other uh, and, um, and um, to, to, to be burdened by all that witnessing. The trees I've glimpsed from the window of a night train were the saddest trees. They seemed about to speak, then vanished like soldiers. The hostesses handed out starched linens for sleep. Passengers bent over small icons of sandwiches. In a tall glass, a spoon mixed sugar into coffee, banging its silver face against the facets. The window reflected back a figure struggling with white sheets. The posts with names of towns promised a possibility of words for what flew by. In lit up windows, People seem to move as if performing surgery on tables. Chestnut parks sighed the size of creatures capable of speech. Radiation, an etymology of soil, directed into the future, prepared a thesis on the new origins of old roots on secret disfiguring missions of misspellings, on the shocking betrayal of apples, on the uncompromised loyalty of cesium. My childish voice, my hands, my feet, all my things that live on the edges of me shh now. The chestnut parks I about to speak, but now they vanished. I was extracted from my apartment block, chained to the earth with iron playgrounds, where iron swings rose like oil wells. I was extracted before I could dig a language out of air with my childish feet. I was extracted by beaks, storks, cranes, see the conductor punching out eyes of sleeping passengers. What is it about my face that turns it into a document, into a ticket stretched out by a neck? Why does unfolding this starched bedding feel like skinning someone invisible? Why can't the spoons head down in glasses stop screaming? Shh, the chestnuts are about to speak. And I'll finish on a short poem with a bit of sex in it for a change. <laughs> Poet's biography. I picked your book from Sandeep's shelf. The poet's biography read, leaves and teaches. Though the book was fairly recent, it was no longer true. I almost met you once and almost meeting I remember clearly because of my embarrassment. 
I was having loud sex in the hotel room while you stood knocking at the door wanting to give me your book. Now the trains stand frozen in a winter storm. And I pity the trains as if they were shivering butterflies, a whole herd of them, the last of their kind, stuck in the snow England has never seen. Sandeep is cooking dinner, you're dead, the lover's gone, your book in my frostbitten hands. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was completely superb. I'm, uh, we have a few questioners lined up and I'll name them in part to help our videographers pull them into focus. Your first question is gonna come from my former student and a graduate of the State College, Abby Voss, who's currently working on a degree in English education up in Superior, Wisconsin. Yes, all right. Well, hello, I am Abby. Like. Mr. Johnson said, I am a past student. Um, I just had a quick question. I really liked how you wrote a lot about your past. I really like listening about that. Um, I just wanted to ask if writing poetry has always come naturally to you because um, I remember you talked a bit about how music was very important like in your childhood and stuff. Did you also write or did you kind of get into that later in your life? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Abby. And particularly, thank you for working on a very important degree. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the future of this country is in the classroom. <laughs> so, um, you know, I do not think that I write about my past. I do not think that poets uh, have think of um, time in terms of past, present and future. Um, rather, there is this kind of present moment in which everything is happening at once, and the pra pa past does not necessarily haunt us, it's just present, mm -hmm. present with us, right? It does not leave, um, and so it's always present, and I write about things that are always present. Yeah. To me, um, I think that it was um, Jeff, or as you say, Mr. Johnson, <laughs> <laughs> who in his introduction used the word obsession. Uh, and it's actually, um, he was very careful about it, but it's one of my favorite words. <laughs> I am um, openly an obsessed person, a person with a lot of obsessions uh, that I allow to take over me. And um, so there's, for me, there's no past. There are only things that obsess me. Yeah. Um, and, um, and so in that way, yes, music is also still important. It's always important to me. I grew up playing music music and now um, uh, music is always there. I try to create music out of simple words, out of ordinary words. I use music a lot in this past year that has been so difficult to assemble yourself, right? We are so scattered. And poetry is what uh, Lucille Clifton, a great American poet, wrote that um, a poet gathers what is scattered. But I think also music gathers what is scattered. It gathers our scattered emotions. When we say, I'm overwhelmed. Yes, it means we're scattered. And music, poetry gathers everything together. And I constantly have found myself turning to music um, during this difficult year. In the morning when I wake up and I'm already scattered brained, um, <laughs> and, um, and then I turn on Bach. I turn on Mozart if I feel very sad. Mozart always makes me happy. Bach always puts me together. Mm. Bach says, here's your brain in front of you. Use it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it's, um, and, and then, um, yeah, so it's all, all important and it's all very much present. And I've, yeah, I've always written poems. Um, and uh, I've always, uh, uh, turned to music and listened to it, close listen to it, the way that we clo uh, close read books. Uh, it's something that 
puts me together, but also wakes me up. Um, you know, the, the older you get, you, you will see that I speak that from the high heel of my 40th year. <laughs> so uh, the more life presents you with the routines that you do not choose for yourself, right? with things that are never your choice, things that are imposed. And art, music, and literature wake you up to what you feel and what you want and allow you to, to stay yourself rather than to become that kind of a gray, faceless being. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Karen Weinhandel is one of my honor students, very serious about literature. Taryn. Hello, lovely reading. Thank you. Um, hi, Karen. hi. Through Johnson's classes, we've talked a lot about poetry and the meaning of poetry and how it can be interpreted by lots of people. So I'm wondering what your answer is um, to how do you think the author's intentions impact the meaning of a poem? and its ability to be interpreted by all kinds of different readers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, that's, it's a very big philosophical question. <laughs> yeah, because you're really asking, what you're really asking is what is poetry, <laughs> right? What is poetry to a poet and what is poetry to a reader? Um, and, um, I, I think that what makes poetry different from prose, for instance, is that it does not get hung up on the meaning too much. It's not, um, I think that often um, uh, uh, people might mistakenly think of a poem as a kind of a riddle to solve, right? To crack it, to crack the, to extract the meaning and move on. But poetry is not utilitarian like that. It's not a crossword puzzle to solve, even though it does puzzle us. <laughs> And yes. it does ask us to think uh, horizontally and vertically <laughs> and in That's diagonal. Fair. Yeah. Um, but um, I think that poetry is an experience, is a space for us to think through, um, to think through exactly think, and realizing at a certain point that there is no meaning and there is no answer, right? That we do not actually, we are not in possession, we're not capable of um, answering the most important questions. So some kind of small practical meanings we can solve, but the most important of them, we cannot. And when we panic in that moment, we have the space of poetry in which it is okay not to solve any riddles, but to be in the space of bewilderment, in the, in the space of awe and amazement, right? Instead of saying, what is the meaning of your life, Terry? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> can you answer that question? <laughs> and if you cannot, how can you live with yourself? <laughs> <laughs> right? The, a poem says you could kind of wake up in the middle of the night, sit up in your bed and think, I'm alive and I'm amazed by that. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of amazed that I can sit right now in my bed and everywhere on my street is asleep and somewhere a door is, dog is barking and it's sort of amazing to think that I'm here under the stars and uh, those kind of big questions do, cannot be answered and I feel fine in this space of poetry but then uh, going for intention right the intention of what did there's a po poet intend well I think that um, a poet um, even though a, a good poem might seem very effortless a good poet is always in control and is putting a lot of work into communicating uh, a certain experience to you and creating a, this space for you very intentionally. Uh, the language of poetry is a very intentional, fabricated language. Um, it, a po poetry, right, is making. A poet is a maker. 
Um, so um, I think that if you write, if I write a poem um, in which I ask myself, well, who am I, right? Where, where, where do I belong? Uh, I feel very, I feel at a loss because I do not know, because I come from this history history of violence and that's all I inherit and how can I live with this history of violence um, so if I read write a poem about that and then somebody some student in a class somewhere says I think it's a poem about my dog this poem makes me think about my dog <laughs> you know and the teacher says well poetry is like that the intention does not matter as long as you connect to it and think about your dog it's fine no it's not fine I do not think it's fine, right? I would like, I would like for you to enter the space that I create and understand the questions that I pose here. So intention does matter, but also I want for my poems to know more about me than I do. And I want for them to be smarter than me and more interesting than me. So I have my intentions, I have my obsessions, but I also want to be carried away by poetry, which means uh, being surprised and not being in control. So I have to give up control at some point and let language take control of me and of my imagination and my memory. And I have to follow language into a place of surprise. So there is intention there, but there is also giving up on your intention and, um, and allowing po poetry uh, to co take control of you because poetry has its own goals for you and language, language is full of meanings and, uh, and layers and um, you have to listen to it too and not only to your intentions. Thank you so much. English professor Adam Marcotte is one of the <clears throat> most gifted teachers at this state college. He also directs Valgina, our honors program, which is the largest in the men's state system. Uh, uh, good afternoon and welcome to CLC. Um, I had a question for you in the beginning and you answered it during your reading. And it was both about our pets and what they mean in poetry. But also, um, I was going to you know, ask about the, the role of poets in times like these, in times where we inhabit uh, this space where there's incredible change. But you said in the very opening um, that the job of the poet is to listen to the language or to listen to languageless beings. And I think all of us here who are attending a poetry reading understand the power of vocabulary and the role that language can have in sort of, in terms of capturing some of these things, right? These things that are happening around us. Um, but I'm not sure everyone is convinced that language and text matter this much. So I guess my question is, do you have any advice for us as you know we go forward and we try to name or articulate um, why do words matter and how do we convince others around us that you know though it's the vehicle for making a difference wow what an easy question <laughs> i'm glad i'm not adam's student because he's asking really difficult questions <laughs> and you see, Abby, I see now that Abby has been through through fire and whatever is cannons. How do you say it? <laughs> that's I mean, that's a question that every new, I think every new generation of people invested in language um, um, ask. Um, and um, for somebody who comes from Eastern Europe, um, that uh, uh, that uh, is um, um, a, a question that can be tackled uh, from uh, from the point of view of who controls the narrative and who tells the story, and the very long story of censorship, history of censorship. So. Um, Writers matter. The government, the state right now is afraid of writers, afraid of artists, not just people actually who use words, but also people who use image, because I think that the era of pure um, language arts is over and we are right now in the era where we need both words and image together, visual image. 
And so um, visual artists, but also musicians, also words and music, actors, monologues delivered from the stage, um, they're all people in danger. And so, in, and they were immediately hunted and arrested. Publishers, publishers are being arrested um, uh, for, for not doing nothing but publishing uh, because um, it really matters uh, that the stories have been told. It really matters that conversations happen. It really matters that we, um, not only the state, not only the government, uh, monopolizes the language that we're not only told what is happening to us, but we also get to ask, but what is happening to me? And what is the language that is true to me? Because if this is what we do as writers. We sit down and we start unlayering all the language that, does, that is not ours. It's all imposed on us. Um, and, and we repeat it. And I think that that's what we really understand um, when we read and when we close read and when we talk about the choice of those words on the page, just how much we take for granted, just how much is imposed on us in order to make us believe something that might not be necessarily true in order to take us into this kind of obedient objects and not the agents of our lives, not the subjects able to tell their own truths. And you see now how much, I think that right now in the United States, there is a great blossoming of literature. There's a great blossoming of um, literary arts, poetry, poetry readings gather huge crowds because suddenly they appeared a great need while because while the media outlets right are in a uh, debate over whose truth is truer <laughs> and um uh, and or are repeating co continuously repeating the same kind of language the same kind of cliches things happen and we can tell how each media outlet is going to talk about it. We know it in advance. We know everybody's cliches in advance. Somebody gets murdered and we know exactly what the mayor is going to say. We know what the police chief is going to say. We know what president, whoever it is, is going to say. It's just the same, the same formulas that are repeated. And what we do in our classes in which we read is is exactly, look, we crack that. We say, this is not solid. You think that this is made of wood or steel, right? That this is something solid and we just drop it and it's an egg. Yeah, we drop, it's broke. This, it's not, there's nothing is solid about this picture that has been given to us, about this language that has been given to us. It's not of steel, it's an egg and it cracks immediately. So what do we left with then? Muteness, utter muteness, right? This is, I think we're in this state of long mourning and we say, I'm mute, I have no words. I have no words, otherwise I'll have to repeat the cliches. And I think that in, because I also teach, yeah? And <laughs> I teach and this is what I talk about a lot is we start not with words, but how mute we are. We say how language is such an um, imperfect system that we uh, trust so naively. <laughs> We're like children, yeah, with, with language if we do not, uh, if we're not careful about it. So I think that our job always is to drop this steel and show that it's all an egg and that what we think this reality that is so hard, I think an English teacher comes and just pokes a finger through it and says, nope, it's not hard, it's paper and the wind is blowing. <laughs> it's blowing and we're all mute. You thought it was your language, but no, it's an imposed one. We begin now with having nothing to say to each other. We begin now with our sadness, with our rage, 
with our sense of loss, with um, our sense of being misunderstood, um, or with joy too, that, you know, who, who can we share our joy with? <laughs> yeah, how can we express it? Again, we resort to all these cliches. And so we say, well, at least we have this literature and we could talk about it. And through reading, through reading uh, the works of people who recognize this, we could find some kind of language that would be true, true to our experience, which is why with, uh, and this goes back, um, now uh, to um, something, oh, I think, uh, to Taryn was saying about how we read for intention or something like that with great literature. It's our friend. It's our companion. Uh, I say, I'm not um, right, giving you reading assignments. I'm introducing you to your friends. <laughs> yeah, these, these books are going to be your companions. When nobody else is going to listen to you, you're going to pick up Anna Karenina and it's going to speak to you at different points of your life. It's going to grow with you. That's how you can always take to tell between great literature and not so great literature. With, I mean, not so great literature also serves its purpose. But great literature uh, is a different kind of a listener and is a different kind of a space at different stages of your life. We read it differently. So we return, I think we return to that great tested literature at different stages of our life when we find ourselves mute often. And we know that uh, 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 this year brought great book sales. <laughs> people turned to, people went looking for that kind of companionship um, of language. Uh, uh, that is creative and deliberate and magical. Um, and people reread what they thought they knew, and it was a different kind of companion to them. So I think that we are um, with, um, we are more than ever in the moment when that kind of critical thinking and need to recognize what is truly your language, your words, and what is imposed on you is so, so critical. Yeah. Um, and, and then, and this kind of place, time of great loneliness and isolation. And uh, um, this is, we, the books are there. <laughs> they are, and so I'm just, here are your friends. These are your friends. Um, and it's just, I think that English teachers have always been more than just teachers. Yeah, we, we teach not just language or, or, you know, like literature, but we teach how to be alive, how to be a human being. <laughs> yeah. I think so, that's, that's the yeah. most optimistic thing I've heard in such a long time. Thank you for your answer. And everybody needs to be an English teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think, thank you for that question. I think that every human being is an English teacher or whatever your language is for yourself. Yeah, that's right. We'll co-op the, we'll co-op everybody into the English major uh, family. I like that idea. Thank you. Yeah, we all have that inner grandmother, right? <laughs> but also we have to have our own inner English teacher, inner librarian. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Gina, this hour has gone by like a swiftly flowing river, and I want to thank everyone who attended this poetry reading for, for coming. And from my heart, <clears throat> I want to thank you for concluding my series, ninth year of programming, Verse Like Water. And I hope that fate smiles, and then I get to meet you someday uh, in person. Stay safe and well, and farewell, Vajina Mort. Thank you so much. Thank you. Diakuyu.